is an MSNBC special presentation. There was a bang. And we all said, what was that? Was that a shot? John Kennedy's been shot. The announcement came on the radio that the president, in fact, had died. Chet Huntley uh, from NBC News uh, broke in. President Kennedy was assassinated today in a burst of gunfire in downtown Dallas. Suddenly he was gone. And of course everybody said, well, it can't be true. It can't be true. I mean, this can't be true. You just don't believe something like that's happening in America. I fear for the future of the nation. And I cried and cried and cried. Shock, dismay, anger, sorrow. And seeing everybody just with that look of panic and being upset and, and it was it was everywhere the life of the nation changed in a cataclysmic way JFK the day that changed America from historic Faneuil Hall in Boston here is Chris Matthews good evening Boston is where you'll find John F Kennedy's electoral roots it was from here the young veteran was elected to the Congress in the years just after World War II. It was here that he won his seat in the U.S. Senate. When Kennedy bid for the nation's highest office, it was here in Boston, right here in Faneuil Hall, that JFK made his final campaign appearance on Election Eve, 1960. Kennedy won that election, of course, one of the closest ever. But his presidency also turned out to be among the shortest. After barely a thousand days in office, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. It was in Dallas, Texas, on November 22nd, 1963. It was a day that changed America. Over the next hour, we'll hear from an extraordinary cross-section of Americans remembering that day and the days that followed, the sense of shock, of stark, violent loss. No one who lived through it will ever forget. John F. Kennedy brought possibility to the White House in the early 60s, youthful energy and idealism mixed with the tough-minded pragmatism of a political pro. He made mistakes, but learned from them. And by late 1963, he was confident, popular, eager for a second term. The trip to Texas that November was a preview of the 64 campaign. Wife Jacqueline, who had recently lost a new baby, was at his side. Leaving Washington that morning, John F. Kennedy seemed on the top of the world, at the top of his game. <laughs> Is the news. Here's a report from San Antonio from NBC News' Robert McNeil from WOAI-TV. For a trip the White House again calls non-political, the president arrived with a very political-looking escort of 17 Democratic congressmen and Mrs. Kennedy. Kennedy went to several cities in Texas to try, looking towards the election in 1964, to try and calm the, um, the uh, splits among uh, Texas Democrats who were torn apart. White Southerners did not like Kennedy's basic principles, his call to end racial discrimination. The hate mail poured into the White House. A good many uh, people who hated him already hated him because he was a Catholic. But Kennedy wasn't deterred by uh, hate mail or by criticism. And it was Mrs. Kennedy who was featured at the arrival, turning on the smile that hasn't been used in domestic politicking since the campaign in 1960. Oh, she was thrilled to be going because she was going to help Jack. It was, quote, help Jack, unquote. Kennedy was different. He was younger. He had a lot of pizzazz. The nation became enamored with this young, attractive, able, articulate uh, uh, president of the United States. Tomorrow, the president visits Dallas, where police are taking special precautions in case of unfriendly demonstrations. Kennedy had been warned that it could be dangerous to go to Dallas because there were right-wing opponents there. Just the day or so before the visit is where a few things came out, like a brochure that was handed out uh, that President Kennedy was wanted for treason. We would be foolish, I think, not to anticipate some trouble. I, I don't, really, I don't anticipate any violence. It could not have been a more joyous, enthusiastic crowd. And that was all remarkable, given all the apprehension about how Dallas would receive him. I was six cars back in the motorcade in Dallas. Uh, we came around under the underpass and on to Dealey Plaza and passed an undistinguished building, which I later learned was the Texas School Book Depository. The car turned off of Houston onto Am Street and uh, started 
approaching us and I guess when it was probably uh, 50 to 100 feet from us we heard uh, two noises that were fairly close together that sounded like firecrackers to me. And there was a bang and we all said what was that? Was that a shot? Was that a backfire? Was it a fireworks? And we all, there was that kind of exchange and then there was a bang bang like that close together. I said those are shots. When it got directly in front of us is when the third shot hit him in the head and he fell over into Mrs. Kennedy's uh, lap. And I can remember her hollering, oh my God, no, they've shot Jack. And that's when I turned to Gail and I said, that's it, hit the ground. It was impossible to tell at once where Kennedy was hit, but bullet wounds in Governor Conley's chest were plainly visible. I was uh, 23 years old. I was working in a newsroom in Omaha, Nebraska. The newsroom was abandoned. I was the only one on shift. I'd gotten to work that morning at about 5, and I had just finished the noon news. And um, the bells began to ring on the AP and the UPI ticker. I wandered over to see what was going on and stared in disbelief. I was in the CBS newsroom. I called Frank Stanton, who was the president of CBS. And the secretary said, Mr. Hewitt, he can't be disturbed. He's in a meeting. He'll call you back. I said, disturb him. She said, what do you mean? I said, the president of the United States has been shot. She said, oh, my God, wait. Uh, in those days, in the Midwest at least, the network was dark. There was no network, and it was local programming. And we had a kind of woman show that talked about gardening. I ran downstairs at KMTV in Omaha and began to read a bulletin on the air and and you know everyone was discombobulated and disoriented the air was filled with uh, the screams of women and children a sort of very feminine wailing filled the air and everybody lay down on the on the sidewalks on the grass on the edge of the parkway like a million people screaming shrilly on most amazing sound of high soprano wails the car in front of us went from eight miles an hour to 80 miles an hour and I knew something was wrong. I asked Chief Curry to call Parkland Hospital emergency, you know, through, through his police network and tell him that we were on our way and, and to be ready for us and so forth. A policeman stopped me, asked me who I was, and I was just telling him when a little black boy came up and said to us, Mr. I seen a man with a gun right up in the window there. Uh, and then a woman, very distracted woman came up and said he wasn't hurt, was he? And I said, I don't know. And the policeman said he was hurt bad. He took me over to his motorcycle, and the radio was saying severe head wounds, Parkland Hospital. Uh, it was such a sudden impact that it had. Uh, I, I can recall I hit the ground with my fist a couple of times like that, and I said, uh, some son of a bitch has shot the president. I was in Washington. I was uh, in my uh, White House car coming back from a luncheon meeting and received word to get back to the White House immediately, and I returned and uh, heard that terrible news. That was the first time I remember sort of going out in the streets and seeing everybody just with that look of panic and being upset, and, and it, was, it was everywhere. Associated Press journalist uh, read the bulletin on the wire and brought it into my office and I was infuriated and said, um, Rocky, if this is somebody's idea of a joke, it's sick. And his eyes welled up with tears. And he said, John, I wish it were. I was a sophomore in high school, and our teacher was called out of the room. And when he came back in, he just looked stricken. And he said, they, I remember this, they've shot the president. You couldn't even believe it. I mean, it seemed so unimaginable in America, at least the kind of safe, secure America I'd grown up in. I was glued to the television because I just didn't think it was true. I thought, there has to be a mistake. And, and if he was shot, he's going to be all right. Our headmaster took the microphone to tell us that our hero, President Kennedy, had been shot. And there was a shock that went through all of us because he was our hero. He was us, Irish Catholic from Boston. I heard it on the car radio that President Kennedy had been shot. And it was so sad. It was unbelievable. Uh, I cried like so many 
hundreds of thousands and millions of Americans. The nuns immediately got uh, the entire school up out of their desks and uh, over to the church uh, to pray for the uh, president. Learning that the president was critically wounded, stunned Chicagoans turned to their churches, leaving their offices in the loop, their homes and businesses in the suburbs. My family were really not religious people, and I remember being drawn to the temple and people drawn to their houses of worship just to go there and get some sense of comfort. I was in Holy Cross College. The professor came in and said that uh, the president's been shot. And um, he didn't have many details. Uh, and everybody just sort of was shocked. Uh, he said it, he may be dying. We don't know. Once I was in Studio 8H, where Saturday Night Live comes from, I was looking at uh, renderings for a set of a new game show that I was doing there, producing there. And someone came in and said, John Kennedy's been shot. And all of us became motionless. I remember it vividly. And we just quietly put down, said that ends the day, and we left and went to the news floor of NBC because we knew everybody in there if we could pick up something. And as we walked, people were coming down, all the news people crying, tears running down their face. Secret Service man came up to me when I identified myself and he told me the president had been shot, Governor Connolly had been shot, and they were at Parkland Hospital. So we raced over there in a deputy sheriff's car, and when I got there, I went in the basement where dozens of people were gathered, grieving, uh, somber. Uh, hysteria was uh, traveling around that room like an epidemic. They have uh, sent out from Parkland Hospital a call for top surgical <laughs> specialists in Dallas and also a call for a Roman Catholic priest. But again, the best information we have now is that the president is still alive. So we got off the elevator and went around the corner out into the main part of the emergency room and I saw immediately there was a huge crowd there, very uncharacteristically. And then the crowd parted as I got about halfway down toward trauma room one, and I saw Mrs. Kennedy sitting there on the chair with her blood-stained clothing on, and I thought, oh, my. Uh, Frank, uh, to, to interrupt for a moment, there is this from Dallas. President Kennedy has been given blood transfusions at Parkland Hospital in an effort to save his life. JFK, the day that changed America. Good bones, buildings that have good structure. And a lot of times when people see a building that looks like this one, they see perhaps despair. We see the possibilities. We are able to revitalize the good bones of the buildings. My name is Maria Miller. I'm a banker, and I'm proud to be part of Bank of America. The bank has committed to lend and invest $350 billion over 10 years. And to put that into terms that I can understand, that works out to $100 million a day over 10 years. That to me is such a significant investment to make a real discernible impact in our neighborhoods. Community development banking is the bank bringing all of its resources to bear, this lending, investment, small business loans, to strengthen our communities. And we do it nationwide. We said it takes one step at a time to make really substantive difference. We do it neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block. It's all about sustaining the community, and together we're able to make really magical things happen. We are the builders. Bank of America. Higher standards. campaigned and debated, but have you really heard anything? The Democratic candidates debaters on MSNBC and what they say this night could help put them in the Oval Office or get them voted off the island. Join Tom Brokaw for the Democratic candidates debate, November 24th at 9 on MSNBC. Brought to you in part by Liberty Mutual. Want to win that race? Improve your chances and reduce the risk of pain and injury with custom inserts and orthotics from Foot Solutions. A proper fit equals a healthy foot. The experts at Foot Solutions know the importance of a proper fit. Using free computerized imaging, they'll scan and measure your feet to ensure optimum comfort and support. 
Custom inserts and orthotics provide improved stability and performance. You'll feel the difference when you're crossing that finish line. Run into Foot Solutions today, your complete foot care center. On KCET, life begins at 7. Huel at 7.30. First, it's Life and Times. I'm Val Zavala. Southern California's award-winning news magazine. Outstanding journalism. Out in the field. And then it's Huel. We're just heading down the road. On the road and up and down our state. Two local favorites. One great hour. Life and Times, followed by Huel Hauser. Weeknights starting at 7 on KCET. Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead. Out of bullet wounds. The black, ugly words are in print. President shot dead. President dead. We got into a police car, went out to Air Force One. I didn't know why. Uh, it had been removed to a remote corner of Love Field and guarded now by a cordon of heavily armed, very menacing looking men. I got on the airplane and then suddenly from the rear of the plane came this six foot four figure of Lyndon Johnson. And Judge Hughes uh, was about to administer the oath when uh, Johnson asked one of the uh, staffers to see whether Mrs. Kennedy wanted to uh, participate. And so we waited a few minutes and then she arrived into the room and of course uh, the room fell silent at this point. Johnson walked over to her, took her by the hand and placed her to his left. Mrs. Johnson was on his right and then uh, he nodded and she proceeded with the oath. Immediately after the oath, he kissed Mrs. Johnson. He went over and, uh, and kissed Mrs. Kennedy. This afternoon, wherever you were and whatever you might have been doing, when you received the word of the death of President Kennedy, that is a moment that will be emblazoned in your memory and uh, you will never forget it as, um, as long as you live. This was my closest friend, my leader, my guide, my hero, my role model, my champion. Um, he was the center of my life and my attention, and uh, suddenly he was gone. I was stunned. I thought, this doesn't happen. You know, I'd grown up in the, in the heartland in small town America, kind of the innocence of that time. Even though the specter of the Cold War was hanging over us, we didn't shoot our presidents, and not this president. My first reaction, since after all I'd known him a long time, was, uh, it's not possible. Jack does not get shot. President McKinley gets shot. Abraham Lincoln gets shot. Jack Kennedy does not get shot. It was a terrible time because you didn't know what happened. Were we being attacked? Was this the Russians? <laughs> Were it the Cubans? Was it the Mafia? Nobody knew. Shock, dismay, anger, sorrow, a mixture. Um, and immediately I th thought about what happens to the armed services, the armed forces, because the commander-in-chief is, uh, is, uh, has just been killed. We were in the second day of rehearsal of the Van Dyke show, and all of a sudden somebody says, come into the prop room, which is where the television was, and there was the news, Cronkite telling us that we lost our president. And we just sat there. We looked at each other. Should we go home? Should we do what? And we decided that we're going to do the show four days, three days hence. I said, we can't ask people to laugh at it. Nobody's going to laugh. And we decided, the only show out of 158 shows we did without a studio audience. My mother came uh, to pick me up at school. And um, she seemed strange and she seemed sad. And, um, uh, you know, she took me home and said, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the president's been killed, a great man's been killed. And uh, so, you know, I, I, and, and it was weird because I thought about it a lot on uh, September 11th because I went to pick my daughter up. Life in a good part of the United States and indeed a good part of the world remains at a virtual standstill, stunned into immobility by the assassination of President Kennedy. My father went out um, because there were some men from the city who were working with the flooding on the street outside. My father was out there, and they must have had their radio on. And I remember just watching it like 
through the window like a scene in a movie. I, I could see that in the rain, my father had started to cry and was listening to something and he came running in the house and with the rain pouring and, and I could see he was crying and he ran to the phone to call my mother at work to tell her. And that's when he told me. I feared for the future of the nation and the future of the civil rights movement because we saw the Kennedy administration as a sympathetic referee in the struggle for civil rights. The face and voice of a young girl summed it up. What's your feeling right now? I really couldn't say. Really, right now I just don't know what to do. I don't even know where to go, what to say. There's nothing for me to say. All of a sudden the world became a nasty place because you'd say, how could this happen? Our president, so attractive, the family, the whole thing. I mean, how could this happen? So it was, in a sense, maybe for me, the first time of the loss of an age of innocence. Here you were watching uh, this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, being taken from the, you know, the jail in Dallas, and you actually saw him get shot. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Detective JFK, the day that changed America. It's coming. It's about to get very cold in here. The best movie of the summer becomes the DVD of the year. Oh, yeah. Who's that from this side? X2 on DVD November 25th. The Zales Holiday Keepsake Music Box, exclusively designed by Lennox, with a diamond heart pendant for just $99. More than just music to her ears. Exclusively at Zales, making moments last a lifetime. Mortgage interest rates have changed. Now may be a great time to lock in a new low fixed rate from Ditech.com. Call 1-800-71-FIX or log on to Ditech.com right now. Ditech.com, your mortgage solution delivered. take advantage of a good thing, then we've got a phone plan for you. Call anyone, anywhere from home. The more you talk, the better the deal. Go ahead, take advantage of us. This line has the guaranteed best prices at top-of-the-line hotels. You choose the price, neighborhood, get a two-, three-, or four-star hotel, and they'll find it. Save up to 40% off Expedia and Travelocity. Top-of-the-line, guaranteed best price, price by. Last Thanksgiving, about two million people tried to deep fat fry their turkey. Fifteen succeeded in setting their houses on fire. At Christmas, there was a lot of driving over the river and through the woods and a little bit of skidding on the ice and taking out Grandma's garage door. So while you're celebrating, Allstate will be standing by. Trouble never takes a holiday. Neither should your insurance. That's Allstate, Stan. Are you in good hands? They've campaigned and debated, but have you really heard anything? The Democratic candidates debate us on MSNBC, and what they say this night could help put them in the Oval Office or get them voted off the island. Join Tom Brokaw for the Democratic candidates debate, November 24th at 9 on MSNBC. Brought to you in part by Liberty Mutual. Good evening. The essential facts are these. President Kennedy was murdered in Dallas, Texas. He was shot by a sniper hiding in a building near his parade route. He was dead within an hour. Lyndon Johnson is President of the United States. The other images that stand out in my mind of that weekend are um, Jackie standing below the airplane at Andrews Air Force Base waiting for the coffin uh, to be lowered and seeing what appeared to be blood on the clothing of the president's wife. I remember thinking at the time that he can't possibly have been killed. You know, it just, it was, it was incomprehensible to me that the president would be killed. The whole White House staff couldn't believe what had happened. They walked around on tiptoe, no noise in the hall. 
halls were always noisy and full of laughter and people teasing each other, greeting each other, not a sound. And when I got to Washington at the airport, uh, I was told that Caroline and John had been taken from the White House to our house in Georgetown and that they had not been told uh, of their father's assassination. All of the radios and televisions had been, of course, unplugged so they wouldn't try to turn it on and watch a cartoon and discover the news that way. I felt that I had not only lost my president, but I lost a friend. I was like in slow motion that whole time. I mean, uh, it was to try to sleep and eat, but you were glued to the television because I wanted to know everything that, that was going on. The sniper's nest has been found and police have recovered a British 303 rifle with a telescopic sight. Also, police searching that area found three empty 303 cartridge cases. One man has been taken into custody. He was taken into custody in the Texas theater in Dallas. The Dallas police chief, Jesse Curry, announced just a few moments ago that charges of murdering President Kennedy have been filed against the Harvey Oswald. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. No, sir, I didn't keep it the 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 Sir? You shoot the president? I work in that building. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man! Did you shoot the president? No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I lived in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. He's looking at the chief of police in a crowded, hot-looking corridor in Dallas a while ago. It seemed to me to be that all this sadness and horror was caused by a punk with a mail-order rifle. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. I ask for your help and gods. There was a solemn procession in Washington early this morning as the body of President Kennedy was taken to the White House from the Bethesda Naval Hospital. The chief executive returned for the last time to the house from which he had governed the nation. And I sat on this little couch for days and days and days and I didn't eat, I didn't talk. I was sort of lost inside myself and I cried and cried and cried. President Kennedy gave us all hope. I mean, he was young, he was vibrant, and uh, we all had a sense of purpose. To see him uh, go like that, it was uh, devastating. For some reason, I walked in the East Room first, and there in the middle of the room was a stand with um, the President's casket on it. It's just Im impossible to realize or believe that all that life and vigor and grace and joy was gone. It is quiet at the White House. It's a dull gray day. It's raining here. Within the confines of that great White House, a lonely little boy who observes his third birthday Monday wandered through a big Washington house today complaining, I don't have anyone to play with. All of America was in shock that weekend, no one more than Jacqueline Kennedy, suddenly a widow at age 34. Yet she took charge of planning a funeral worthy of a Lincoln, a Roosevelt, a John F. Kennedy. Over the next two days, there would be a solemn procession to the Capitol where the body would lie in state, a funeral service attended by dignitaries from around the world, and finally the burial at Arlington National Cemetery, all of it watched on television by an audience of millions. I'll be back with that part of the story in a moment. What can a seaplane teach us about financial advisors? The best ones take you where others can't. At Wachovia Securities, we learn from the world around us. Because regardless of conditions, investment opportunities can be found. Together, we can achieve uncommon results. Wachovia Securities. So we're all set for Hawaii. Flight, hotel. Hey, look, we can book surfing lessons. I've always wanted to try that. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Or we can go horseback riding. 
Okay. Activities. Another way Expedia helps you create the trip that's right for you. Expedia.com. The Braun Synchro is the first shaver with a four-way moving head. It captures more hair in fewer strokes, so it shaves closer. Only it moves so fast, you can't see it. And to keep it feeling like new every day, it automatically cleans itself in alcohol. Braun Synchro. We challenge you to find a better dry shaver. Slap in the new. But not in the But not in the state of a bike. Here, your IP rollout is smooth sailing. With our technology and services, you keep what you have. The forklift stays parked. Come on, your business. Do what 90% of Fortune 500 companies do. Reach a via a higher plane of communication. Tonight at 10, Joe's real deal on how Rush Limbaugh's month in rehab may impact his opinions and his audience. Scarborough Country, tonight at 10 on MSNBC. Want to save a bundle on Cox Digital Cable, high-speed internet, and digital telephone? It's as easy as one, two, three with the Cox Digital Suite. Right now, get free activation when you complete the Cox Digital Suite and save up to $15 every month. Call 888-367-3712. Get three and save and get one convenient bill, too. Call today and get free voicemail for six months. Get three and save with the Cox Digital Suite. Did the value of your stock portfolio go from thousands of dollars to pocket change? You may be able to recover some of your money. If you lost more than $100,000 in the stock market, call James Rolls House & Associates toll-free at 1-800-203-8495 for a free consultation. That's 1-800-203-8495. James Rolls House practices law in Minnesota and associates with lawyers throughout the U.S. to help people across the country. Call now, 1-800-203-8495. JFK, the day that changed America. From historic Faneuil Hall in Boston, here again is Chris Matthews. Welcome back. The assassination of John F. Kennedy was a horrific crime and a national trauma. It was also one of the biggest news stories ever. Here's the New York Times from the morning after. Kennedy is killed by sniper as he rides in car in Dallas. Johnson sworn in on plane. But for millions of Americans, it all unfolded on television, which stayed with the story nonstop. It was unprecedented. And that common experience over those four days bonded the country in mourning, and even now in memory. On Sunday, November 24th, Kennedy's body was to be moved from the White House to the Capitol Rotunda, where it would lie in state. Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused killer, was to be transferred to county jail. For a grieving nation, it was the second day of gunfire. This is Charles Murphy in the Dallas County Jail in Dallas, Texas, where we, along with about 40 reporters and photographers, are awaiting the arrival, a transfer of Lee Oswald, expected within the next few minutes. We're told there's a crowd of about 2,500 people around the county jail area. We were going out for Sunday dinner, and so I thought I would just turn the TV on and see what was going on, and so I leaned over and turned the television on, and just as the picture was forming, I could hear them saying, he's been shot, he's been shot. He's been shot, he's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. It's absolute panic, absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. It was astounding. I mean, here you were watching uh, this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, being taken from the, you know, the jail in Dallas, and you actually saw him get shot. And I just couldn't believe that it would happen. A man accused of assassinating the President of the United States. Well, how can these things happen? What's, what's going on, you know? Now, lying very pale on the stretcher, he's being put into the ambulance head first. It was about 17 minutes past 12 Eastern Standard Time when it happened roughly 45 minutes before President Kennedy's body was to be moved from the White House and uh, carried to the Capitol Rotunda. I remember watching it on TV and 
seeing my mother hysterical crying. And when you're a kid, you want to do something and you can't do anything. And my mother was very upset when they showed John Jr. And oh, that little boy, what's going to happen to him? The crowd is very silent, lying very deeply on both sides of the avenue. I'll never forget the, the, the drum beat of the cadence when they, they took him down the streets in Washington, D.C. But the part that really stunned me and brought me quickly to the reality that it's true he's gone was when, in the military tradition, the horse in which a president might ride came with the saddle empty and the boots and the stirrups turned backwards. It meant he is no more, that the president um, is dead. Mrs. Kennedy showed such dignity and composure and kindness to everybody else that she was absolutely, uh, she riveted everybody. She calmed them down, she comforted them by the way she held herself up. I think everybody just looked at her and said, well, God, she's the man's wife. If she can hold it together, then we have to. I never could understand how someone could be that strong. I mean, I, I mean, we were all, crying and she was strong for the nation if anyone ever epitomized the expression grace under pressure it is Jacqueline Kennedy within the space of less than four months she has lost a child and her husband the beauty of character she displayed is something we might all wish to emulate when we are called upon to face tragedy in our own lives after the ceremony is concluded the people will file past the body of their late president. There's now a line four blocks long, four abreast, people waiting to file through. These people coming through now have been waiting for at least 10 or 12 hours, waiting very quietly. Good order. I actually went down to DC. I grew up in New Jersey. My mom and dad, who were huge Kennedy fans, we drove down to D.C. Uh, to, to view the body, you know. We, I remember we drove down at night. We got in line. We were all there all night. It was really cold. I was there and just uh, standing in line. And just people, black, white, short, tall, rich, poor, just in line crying. Oh, I was devastated. I, I spent a lost weekend, literally, at, uh, at Yale, glued to this little black and white television set, watching every instant of what was happening, and just despondent. Silently they walk, faces that seem to mirror disbelief. This is when, um, when television came alive, uh, because before that television had covered, uh, uh, really it was more political, and all of a sudden you had a television in your home watching these things unfold. The continuing grief is evident across the United States. Amusement places have shut down. Many sporting events scheduled for the day and for this weekend have been postponed or canceled. I was supposed to do a, um, a stand-up with Dinah Shore in California, but on the news of the president being assassinated, they went dark. And they, then they went dark for about two days. I went out and and learned a lot of our comedy that night because it was one of the best audiences I ever played to because they had to get away from, they just had to get away from the news. Um, they had to deny it for a couple hours and then go back and face it again. Monday, November 25th, 1963. And we're originating our program in Washington where funeral and burial services for John Fitzgerald Kennedy take place today. We were finally got to within, you know, maybe 10 feet of getting in there, and they closed it because they had to get ready for the procession. So we lined up, we got, we stood on Pennsylvania Avenue and watched the dignitaries go by in the caisson roll by with the casket and the flag and everything. 
the image of uh, the family, the grieving family, and maybe the long, cold walk was the image that I would most remember that really was, it was a tragic remembrance, um, both beautiful and horrible at the same time. It was just momentous. It was, it was as though the world had shifted and turned upside down, but she carried herself with such dignity. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy in mourning, Bobby and Teddy flanking her, um, still touch me when I see it. And of course those pictures of John Caroline touch everyone. That little boy saluting will forever be uh, indelibly inscribed, I think, in you. I think it was a, a moment when there wasn't a dry eye in America. I think he personified what America was feeling because we were all children in a very strange time. We all became very vulnerable. And when I heard the sound of the bagpipes, I just dissolved. I just broke down and started sobbing. <laughs> crying and I uh, and I think that was a not a personal emotion I think that was almost a universal emotion his loss was felt so much throughout the world one couldn't help but feel sorrow not just for the loss of the president but for his death the eternal flame she'd seen in France and and other places other countries have it but she spoke to them about it and they said yes we'll do it and did it specially for the president and so on this crisp but sunny november afternoon of john f kennedy the 35th president of the united states is laid to rest on a gentle slope overlooking the city of washington changes regular chicken into ranch chicken. Spices up the chicken, it's not boring. And changes regular potatoes into ranch potatoes. It's got more flavor to it. I like it, I really do. Hidden Valley Ranch, this changes everything. Need fast cash to consolidate bills or pay off credit cards? Call or log on to Ditech.com and apply for a home equity loan with a no closing cost option. Just call 1-800-71-FIX. It's me, this is my voice, I own it, quite frankly, I made it. You hear me? You hear what I'm saying? Here's a little word I like, man. Just like the way it sounds, go get your own sound. This one's mine, man. Singular connects you to the technology with the truest sound in wireless. Just look for the Singular smart chip, proof that we take your voice very seriously. I call it my trust your voice to Singular plan. Truest sound, another reason Singular fits you best. Next, Joe's real deal on how Rush Limbaugh's month in rehab may impact his opinions and his audience. Scarborough Country, next, only on MSNBC. They've campaigned and debated, but have you really heard anything? The Democratic candidates debate is on MSNBC, and what they say this night could help put them in the Oval Office or get them voted off the island. Join Tom Brokaw for the Democratic candidates debate, November 24th at 9 on MSNBC. Brought to you in part by Liberty Mutual.
Bayside Restaurant in Newport Beach. Dining as art. Thinking about refinancing? Concerned that rising mortgage rates will keep you from getting a good deal? Then call CalDirect Home Loans right now. We guarantee you the best rate and fees on all first mortgages, including jumbo loans. And we guarantee to close your loan in just 25 days. Don't wait for mortgage rates to go up again. Refinance with a lender who guarantees you the best rate and fees. Log on to CalDirect.com or call 1-800-CALDIRECT. Great rates without the wait. Americans have been trying to come to terms with John F. Kennedy's death for 40 years. Not just his death, but the meaning of his life and his presidency. What was he able to accomplish in his thousand days? What more might he have done if he had lived? The questions won't go away. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. He certainly was for my generation and succeeding generations the most eloquent president that we've had. For people who are uh, more conservative, I think that Ronald Reagan fills that role for them, but even the Reagan people will be the first to say that no one quite matched the eloquence of John Kennedy and, and he changed the presidency in that regard. The main thing that was apparent about Kennedy is that he made Americans feel very good about themselves and feel hopeful. He was a highly intelligent individual and such a wonderful speaker. Uh, and he's married to Jackie and had these beautiful children. I mean, it was a Camelot, idyllic kind of time. It wasn't Camelot. It was Boston. It was Washington. It was the sign of Irish immigrants to this country. And uh, television had come along and enhanced the glamour of it. But the Kennedy administration, I assure you, was not Camelot. It was politics. We were more accepting of the Camelot because of the, the tragedy. I think if you tried to pull that off now with a new generation that wasn't there, I don't, I don't think it would work. What should be remembered is that the glamorous image could be used to rouse people's interest in politics. Uh, some of it was directed toward tapping into people's idealism. I think that um, the Peace Corps was one of the most effective things for our foreign policy that's ever been conceived of. Those initial Peace Corps volunteers did more for the good of America worldwide than anything we can conceive of. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. The legacy that President Kennedy left that enabled uh, President Johnson to go forward on civil rights and the war on poverty, uh, I think the 60s did a lot of good for the country. And it wouldn't have happened without President Kennedy's life or even maybe without his sacrifice for service. The 60s really started then. The early 60s were the 50s. I mean, there was nothing radical very much going on. And after he got shot, everything changed. He had begun the process of knitting us together as one people, regardless of race, regardless of religion. And that means that in many families still to this day, he is the political hero. You hear young people saying today, I got involved. I, be, I, I decided to get involved in the civil rights movement, or to run for office because I was inspired by the life of John F. Kennedy. I think everybody wants to be like Jack Kennedy because the inspiration that he provided to so many Americans and his martyrdom, let's be frank, uh, obviously covered up some failings that he might have, may, may have had, as every president has had. He has been given the kind of reverence which he didn't earn when he was alive and probably would not have exercised if he had uh, survived Dallas. Nonetheless, I think that you could have to say that it's a legacy that, uh, that most politicians would do well to aspire to, um, to give the country a sense of mission and of hope and direction. Let every nation know 
whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. He was the first telegenic president. I think he mesmerized people by the way he looked, the way he spoke, the way he acted, the way he carried himself. He certainly was charismatic. One of the biggest things that he did is he just, uh, I think, inspired a generation felt uh, like him. We don't really have that with our leaders, I think, today. I think it was probably the, the last time that the country could ever really trust who sat in the Oval Office. I think much of it was a promise unmet. And uh, yet, in some ways, I think the, the sense of uh, romanticism about admiring a president and everything he stood for and confidence in government, that sort of died with JFK. The world changed after JFK's death. Uh, the country changed. We uh, plunged a few months later deep into the war in Vietnam that Kennedy had uh, specifically uh, taken steps not to do. I think he would have found a way to negotiate, just as he had ended the Berlin crisis, just as he had ended the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. He really faced down the Russians at a time when it wasn't so easy to face down the Russians. And it was a very, very dangerous point. Thus far, probably the most dangerous point in our history. The legacy in the space program, I really love the idea, not just for what it means to go there, but what it means to our dreams. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depth, and encourage the arts and commerce. So much of what he stood for was right and is just and noble. And he believed that everybody in this country uh, should have an opportunity at a great life. And um, those are good messages, and that's why they live. And even in hindsight, now looking back, and uh, all the little picadillas and all the little flaws that we have uh, been revealed, and so, still did not, uh, still does not uh, take away from that potential that we all saw. You read what Kennedy had to say, and it's still fresh air. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. He made us believe that the country was something extraordinary. Presidents are often less about what they really do than, than how they're perceived and how they use the pulpit. Uh, and in his case, he used it to dream great things and, and ask the American people to do the same. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. <laughs> I'll return in a moment with my own memories of John F. Kennedy's life and death. Where was I when I heard the news? Not very far from here. I'll take you back for a visit. Come on, I need an answer. If you're shipping internationally, you gotta use FedEx. Brilliant, Al. You're a real lifesaver. Huh? <laughs> so then I said, if you're shipping internationally, you gotta use FedEx. You're so smart. <laughs> so I tell these guys, if you're shipping internationally, you gotta use FedEx. These guys have nothing. So I say, you ship it internationally, you, you gotta, gotta use FedEx. That's right. That's right. Tell them. And I think we all remember the time when Al here said... If you're shipping internationally, you've gotta use FedEx. standard features my car makes me feel like I'm a step ahead of the game the Camry LE starting at 19560 
to take advantage of a good thing? Then we've got a phone plan for you. Call anyone, anywhere from home. The more you talk, the better the deal. Go ahead, take advantage of us. Priceline has the guaranteed best prices at top-of-the-line hotels. You choose the price, neighborhood, get a two-, three-, or four-star hotel, and they'll find it. Save up to 40% off Expedia and Travelocity. Top-of-the-line, guaranteed best price, Priceline. Because we own the land, the trees, and the company, Florida's natural is made just from our fresh oranges, not from concentrate. It's as close to the grove as you can get. It is their life. It's their livelihood. It might be classified as a small business, but it's certainly not a small business to the person who owns that business. We let small business owners do what they do best, which is run their business. And we do what we do best, which is to come in and give them advice and counsel on their financial affairs. That's probably the best part of, of what we do, is to be able to see companies start very small and then grow and to come into much larger companies. I am Rod Banks, and I'm a banker, and I'm proud to be part of Bank of America. We believe in small business. We've invested in small business. Today, we bank nearly one in five small businesses, and that, that's a powerful statement for us, is that uh, over two million small businesses in the United States bank with Bank of America. It's their business, and if we're good, it is paving the way for the next generation to come. Bank of America, higher standards. Next, Joe's real deal on how Rush Limbaugh's month in rehab may impact his opinions and his audience. Scarborough Country, next, only on MSNBC. Once again, Chris Matthews. This is the campus of Holy Cross, not far from Boston. I was a freshman here in 1963 when I heard the news about John F. Kennedy. It was just after lunch, and I was down in the basement of Kimball Hall checking my mailbox. And a classmate came up and said, somebody's just shot Kennedy. I had a world history class that afternoon, and by the time I got there, everyone was talking and wondering what had happened. All we knew is that someone had taken a shot at the president, nothing else. The history professor, James Powers, announced that he would hold the lecture, but we didn't have to stay. From Dallas, Texas... When I got to a TV, I turned it on and sat there amazed as Walter Cronkite told what had happened. And then, taking off his reading glasses, said that the president was dead. Standard time. I remember going through a terminal in New York a few days later and an older woman asking me where I went to school. When I told her Holy Cross, I remember her saying how people must be so sad up there in Kennedy's home state. It was a lot bigger than that. I think something changed in this country that day. We went from the early 60s of short haircuts and thin ties and the new frontier to the 60s of the Beatles, drugs and protest. It took four years until the Gene McCarthy, Bob Kennedy race of 1968 to bring back the hopes that had died that early Friday afternoon of November 22nd. Myself, I was lucky to spend the last years of the 60s in the Peace Corps in Africa. It was a life-changing experience, and I have Jack Kennedy to thank for it. I will never forget listening on the shortwave radio as Americans stepped on the moon, that other JFK program that changed everything. Senator Pat Moynihan of New York, who worked for President Kennedy and loved him, once said to me, the country's never gotten over Kennedy's death. You, Chris, haven't gotten over it. I will always take that as the deepest, warmest compliment. It was as if the old New Frontiersman was welcoming me into a compact of those who would know and live the loss. I'm Chris Matthews. Thank you for joining us. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world.